Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back, data back conversation where we talk all things cannabis, US MSOs, Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. My name is Cy Scott with Headset. I'm joined as always by Emily Paxia of Poseidon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the High Rise. And this week, we have a very special guest uh, and great timing, uh, Matt Hawkins, founder and managing partner of Entourage Effect, capital and chairman of Harborside, soon to be ex-interim CEO also of Harborside. Matt Hawkins, welcome. Thanks, Cy. Thanks, Emily, for having me. Yeah, well, uh, I can't believe the timing here. You guys are making some massive headlines this week. Very good timing. Yeah. Y'all are... Uh prognosticators or something. (laughs) (laughs) You had some understanding. No, it's, we're very excited to have you on this week, especially given that it appears there's not much news and this is good news. So happy to hear more about it. Well, it's good news until you look at, you know, you wonder like we just made, you know, for me, the biggest announcement that I've been able to be a part of in cannabis yet. And then the, you know, capital markets are tanking and, you know, our, my, our stock is no different, you know, but it's just, it's, it, you can't, we're all playing for the long ball. And this is just another one of those things that you got to just, you know, let it roll off your shoulders. Yeah. Well, why don't we uh, take a step back and tell the listeners in case they, in case they missed it because they were watching sure. the mar- broader markets. I mean, it's interesting. It is an interesting week because, you know, even the Dow, I mean, Dow and S and P in the last two days have had a gnarly, gnarly, uh, trend. And so there's, there's like these macro things going on. There's Omicron happening, which I don't know about you guys, but periodically, instead of saying, oh my God, I'm always like, Omicron, <laughs> like those things are going badly. <laughs> but, you know, so we've got that. And then we've got this market that's that's really hooked on, uh, it's like junkies for regulatory updates. So can't get enough of the news around potential for safe, even though we know these companies have so much promise. And as we were talking about with Kim Rivers a couple of weeks ago, like, look at what we've all built in eight years without having any banking reform really at all. So we'll just keep going. But let's give the give the listeners a, you know, an update on on the announcement this week from Harborside and uh, what the sure. means. Yeah, just some background. We had as a firm had taken over the board of Harborside about a year ago through a disgruntled shareholder movement or dissenting shareholder movement, I should say. And then we, uh, in advance of a proxy fight, we luckily didn't need to do that. But we were very, very public about uh, our initiatives. And one was to make Harborside into the preeminent single state operator through accretive M&A. The other was to hire a world-class CEO. The other was to raise capital through pipe and, and real estate financing. And then lastly, begin negotiations with the IRS on our 280E liabilities. And with this announcement of the acquisition of, of uh, Loud Pack and Urban Leaf, we've accomplished all of that. And so we're really, really proud, really happy. Uh, you know, we had already raised significant capital earlier in the year through a pipe and a, uh, a credit facility with a commercial bank. Uh, now we're raising another pipe, smaller in nature, around $10 million. The reason we didn't have to raise, you know, a, a large pipe with dilutive capital is that we were able to raise non-dilutive capital in the form of a real estate loan from Polaris to the tune of $77 million. And that's because of the real estate portfolio that not only we bring, but also Laupac. And so we're now, you know, well capitalized, you know, on a run rate. I think our public statements have said we're somewhere in the, the $220 million uh, annualized run rate with the three companies. That also includes Sublime, by the way, which we acquired earlier in the year. And then once we close in March after the regulatory and, and shareholder approvals, we're going to give Ed Schmoltz, who is the CEO of, uh, of Urban Leaf, who will become our CEO, a quarter or so to, you know, to short things up, make the, you know, start working on the economies of scale, you know, cut the fat where necessary, and we will have, you know, hopefully some significant, significant EBITDA margins relative to the rest of the California market. So uh, we're just, we couldn't be more excited. Ed Schmoltz brings with him a major cachet. You know, he was CEO of Urban Leaf, obviously, before that, CEO of Calix Peak. Prior to that, he was CEO of, of uh, FAO Schwartz and then COO of Patagonia. So big, big name, super hire for us, but also just to have somebody like that in the cannabis industry is a big deal. So couldn't be more happy. 
we're really excited for our shareholders because we think this is going to be a, a great, great opportunity for us to continue to build scale in California and then ultimately have some optionality when um, either, you know, say banking legalization or the MSOs come knocking on our door. Yeah, it was certainly a, a massive uh, combination here. Couldn't have been easy to put all these things together, particularly at the same time with, with Urban League no. and, uh, <laughs> and Loud Pack, uh, kind of very, very different. Well, yeah, just, I mean, just, just to give you a little flavor of that, I mean, you know, you're talking about two private companies that are coming into the fold with a public company. So you've got the inability of, of loudmouths like me who can't talk about it, which was awful. And then, <laughs> and then you've got, you know, the cap stacks of two private companies that have both have note holders and equity holders that have different, different, uh, you know, interests and different, they're not right. exactly aligned all the time. So getting all of that put together in a three-way merger was incredibly difficult. And at the end of the day, it was just about everybody checking their egos at the door and realizing that this isn't about now, it's about the future. Mm -hmm. And this, and the whole is better than the sum of the parts of these three companies. And again, just couldn't be more proud and more excited about what the uh, what the future mm -hmm. holds for us. Yeah, I just wanted to second the, and you know, the favorable comments around Ed, because I've, I've had the chance to meet Ed and spend a little time with him and he is really an exceptional leader. And so I think um, I'm very excited to see how this goes together and how he gets to kind of step into that role at the helm of all three of these into one. So it's pretty exciting. And, you know, we're, we're one thing that's I think is important for listeners, to, especially, you know, cannabis folks to, to understand is that, you know, we're changing our corporate name to State House. But the flagship dispensary in Oakland will, will always remain Harborside. And, you know, and, and Urban Leaf has their own, you know, and that's a tribute to Steve D'Angelo. I mean, he was, a, you know, and we're going to we're going to memorialize the history of Steve and also, you know, Will Sin at, uh, at Urban Leaf, you know, in our stores and just remind people that this is a, you know, these people got us to this point And now we're just the stewards of the businesses trying to take it to the next level. And, you know, Steve and I traded some very nice texts right before the press release went out. And he's excited about this. And I know Will is very excited on the, on the Urban Leaf side. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions, given that, uh, you know, Harborside is such a, a, a big name in the cannabis industry in California and uh, such a such a trailblazer in so many ways. Were you thinking about bringing that brand to Urban Leaf or Urban Leaf over to Harborside? But that makes a lot of sense. You keep them as Urban Leafs and as Harborsides for the foreseeable future kind of. Well, no, the, the, the actual, all the dispensaries are going to be named Urban Leaf. We're going to change except for the flagship in, uh, in Oakland. Cause that, that's the, I mean, when you think of Harborside, that's what you think right. of. And so, and, and we don't want to, you know, and that's a, a big, big business. And we don't want to, even with the unrest in Oakland right now, it's still a very, very important part of our, of our, uh, of our business and don't want to, you know, don't want to minimize that at all. So beyond retail on the, uh, on the brand side, I know you, you the sublime news, uh, some time ago and kind of integrating that. And now with loud pack, um, were you looking for an, an organization like loud pack that has kind of the, the product portfolio that they do, or was it, um, you know, loud pack was just kind of serendipitous. It was just the timing work for both parties, or did you actively go to the market and say, these are the ones we want? We needed more, you know, we wanted to have more products in the house of brands. We wanted to have more manufacturing capabilities and we actually needed a little more cultivation. If we're going to do all this in house. And, you know, one of the things that I had done back when we took this board over is I talked to a lot of the C-level folks at the MSOs. And luckily we know a lot of them because like Emily, we invested in a lot of those companies and they were private. So we're, you know, personal friends with a lot of those people. And so to a person, every single one of them said, before we enter California, we want someone to do this for us, basically. We want a fully vertically integrated plug and play, you know, knowing, no, dealing with the regulatory aspects of the state, you know, knowing it cold and basically hand it to us on a silver platter. And so we knew we needed to, you know, bolster our manufacturing and, and production and, and product capabilities. And we've, now we've, we've been able to, to say that we have. 
Yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit about California. You know, I know Ed on the line yesterday. Was it? Gosh, this week is going quickly. It was it was yesterday morning that the announcement came out? But um, I know he was mentioning that California's market is bigger than the next three biggest states combined. Is that is that right? I think that's right. It's a it's a massive market, and it continues. It continues to suffer <laughs> from just the regulatory kind of implementation of this market. But um, I'm just really curious about kind of how your thesis on California. I know you mentioned the MSOs, but also just thinking about it from a brand landscape perspective and product category landscape perspective. You know, what's what's the point of view as as a firm that's really leaned in on California? I know. We're pretty leaned in on California. You're pretty leaned in on California. So we we share in, in the point of view, it seems that there's real opportunity here, but would love to hear your perspective. Yeah. I mean, look, it's there, there, there's real opportunity, but with that brings challenge. And, I, and, I've, and I've been saying for a year and a half now that the winners in this game are going to be the ones that have scaled. And you can't scale without having some type of exposure in California. I mean, this is... California is the, I mean, it, it may very well be the data that you just said, but let's face it, it's the, it's the largest canvas market in the world. And so you better have something going on in California if you're going to, you know, post legalization or, you know, at the point where there's some uh, interstate commerce because it's, it's not going away. And now, you know, the legacy market, you know, still has its, you know, hands all over this. And we're just going to have to keep fighting to make that you know, at some point, tamp it down enough to where it effectively goes away. But I do believe, I still believe that it's always easier to build brands and cannabis, in our opinion, to, to start in California move east versus building a brand elsewhere and, and, and moving west. So I think that's very, very important. And yes, we have leaned in as a firm because it's, it is a lot of hard work, but I still think at the end of the day, the, the fruits of our labor is going to be beneficial because it's just so big. And at some point, we will get to the point where we're not operating in these constraints like we are right now. And, and that's going to be an exciting day. I agree. I'm looking forward to see. I mean, it's almost like I, Morgan and I were talking about it the other day. You know, California started to face issues going into the pandemic. And it seemed as though it got kind of got rescued by the, as we all know, there was the spike in purchasing as people were spending time at home and as checks were being delivered by the government. So they were able to put that towards cannabis. And now we're kind of, well, I don't know. I, I keep, I feel like every week I'm like, yeah, we're going to normalize soon on the backside of this pandemic as things are ramping again in multiple states. But you know, it, whether or not we shut down again will be a whole other can of worms to to understand. But I think that California now is kind of going through the hurt locker that seemed like it could have happened in 2020. It's been delayed till now. And I think we'll have to see what happens. And hopefully the DCC will get its legs under it so it can really start to make some change in 2022 to help this market become more accessible, reconsider how we manage the tax aspect of it. But I agree with you, Matt. I always think about how New York is, you know, our fashion capital in the United States. And I think that in the United States, California is the brand capital for cannabis. That being said, I do think New York will come in and be- There's a, no doubt about it. Yeah, definitely. It will. And, and that's why, I mean, look, in our, I mean, we, we, we leaned in big time in fund one and fund two. And now with our third fund, we're leaning in on the Midwest and the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. And mm -hmm. even in the Southeast, we think there's some incredible opportunities with medicinal states. So we're, you know, it's, it, we've, we checked the box a bit in what we wanted to do in California. There's still some significant opportunities and, and challenges, but we're now starting to explore other parts of the country, which is exciting. Yeah, I think the California market, I mean, just to give listeners into scale, I mean, November, now that we're in you know, just December 1st, November sales uh, at headset came in at $417 million. Uh, that was down from $434 million in October. But this is the same pattern that we saw last year. Like, November sales are just a little lighter uh, than in October. But we're still up 6% versus a year ago. So there's there's still a fair amount of growth that's happening. I mean, but at this run rate, like if it, 
you know, we're to, to sustain at over 400 million. I mean, you're looking at a $5 billion market. And I, I think it's just the early innings yet. Uh, for all those reasons that both of you have been talking about, you know, there's still plenty of the illicit market challenges. There's still plenty of access challenges, uh, taxation challenges. And I think uh, even though it has been an adult use market for some time, it, it's still very early. And, and the opportunity is... Um, it's just getting there. So yeah, moves like this make a lot of sense because you're, you're right on scale. Yeah. And it's the other thing is that we're, even though year over year sales may be up a little bit, we're still competing against, you know, record sales from the pandemic that gave us a sense of, holy shit, we've got this, uh, we've got this figured out. We've converted some of the, uh, the illicit market we're, 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 you know, maybe California's, you know, loosening the, the cuffs a bit. But the reality is, is that, like Emily said, we just delayed this a year, but what makes it worse is that we have a year earlier to where things were just crazy good. So who knows, maybe this time next year, we're gonna have, you know, 12, 15, 20% CAGR, and we'll be like, uh, see, told you so, but you know, who knows? But if it's normalized in, a, in, in California at five, at five billion before we start really tamping down the, the market, then so be it. The illicit market. I right. agree. I mean, I know I'm heading to Hall of Flowers in Palm Springs next week, and I believe the so the show is already like well sold out. And I think, if anything, these the as we talked about on a previous podcast, uh, the Hall of Flowers in Santa Rosa was a big success and has been a big success. This is the one focused on Southern California, which is interesting, Matt, you know, now that you've got this footprint that really covers the entire state, I think the listeners, it's it's interesting as a person who lives in California, who drives up and down this monster state and sees just how different every market in California is. Like the Northern California market is extremely different from the LA market, which is also different from the San Diego market. And you can see how it how it impacts the way that different right. products kind of trend, different brands have stronger traction in different markets. It may be because it's their backyard, but I also think that there's a different kind of demographic and different kind of uh, sensibility around what people are attracted to. And so it's it's just something we think about when we're looking at California is it's not just one one homogenous market by any stretch. And then if you go down more into the inland aspect of it, it's a, it's quite different as well. So it, there's a lot of opportunity for a retailer with a footprint like what you guys have now at Statehouse to have kind of, you know, really focused strategies in each kind of location to you, maybe you'd have the same kind of brand portfolio on the back end, but you can kind of dial it in. So it's uniquely presented depending on where in the market you're you're having representation. Yeah. And I would, and, I, and I'm no retail expert, so it'd be great. I mean, if you guys could get Ed on at some point and, and, and explore that with him, because I'd be, I'd be fascinated to hear. I mean, I've heard him talk about it, and it's, and it, but it is going to be, it's a huge opportunity, but also a challenge, mm -hmm. because you're right. I mean, every single market is, is completely different. It's multiple states within one, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's okay. And so, but yeah, I mean, Ed has a fascinating view on retail just because of the experience. And so I think y'all would enjoy talking to him on this. We should get Ed on, especially so because I've enjoyed conversations with him about his other experience as it translates into cannabis, which I think we'll see more and more of as companies grow and invite um, fresh points of view to the table like Ed. So that's great. So I know we've got to wrap up here, uh, yeah. Matt, uh, on the yeah. SAFE Act, you know, it's not looking good. What do you think? I mean, how does that impact uh, organizations like Harborside? And if it doesn't, if it if it were to go through, how would that be helpful for you? And if it doesn't, does it impact anything? I mean, obviously, we all are just waiting for it to happen. It's the first shoe to drop. You know, it will give us access to cheaper capital. I think the ancillary benefits of the Safe Banking Act are too early. It's too early to tell exactly what else could happen. I mean. Does the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange open up? I mean, who knows? Does B of A start providing credit facilities to us? I mean, who knows? These are, you know, big, big, big changes that are on the horizon, even if they don't do it on day one. So it's just going to be a monumental event when it happens. And uh, like I said, it's the first shoe to drop, and I can't wait for it to happen. Yeah, and it very well might happen, but it, it's certainly not looking good for this uh, defense policy bill at the moment as we're recording this Wednesday, December 1st. But you're right, it's going to happen eventually, and I think it's going to change a lot of things. 
Well, Matt, thanks again for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you and uh, great timing with State House. and congrats on all of that. I know that's certainly not, not easy. Yeah, love talking to y'all. All right. Well, thanks uh, for listening. Be sure to uh, rate and review us and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.